Now, we all know it was a long weekend for WWE fans in general. Uh, just SummerSlam alone, if you watched. Even just the main card, that's four hours of show. And not a particularly good show, so it makes for a very, very long Sunday night. Throw in a two-hour kickoff show if you watched it like I did. That's six hours of WWE in one night. My God, we need to get laid, get a clue, get a life. That's all I'm saying. Then when you throw in the NXT TakeOver Brooklyn show that surely plenty of you watched, it is a lot of wrestling in one weekend. Then to follow that up with a three-hour Raw, I have to say my excitement level was about slim to none for the most part for this week's show. And I'm sure a lot of yours were too, because if anything, it was just WWE fatigue. And I wasn't going to be surprised if the WWE put out a clunker of a show uh, this Raw after SummerSlam. But I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised. The show did not suck. There were actually several highlights throughout the night. Amazing stuff. It's one week, but I'll take it. You kick off with what you should have kicked off with, Brock Lesnar, Paul Heyman. And I'll say this, Paul Heyman's promo was good, probably very good. What you would come to expect out of one of the best talkers in the history of the wrestling business, one of the best managers in the history of the business. With that said, in my opinion, my opinion, for my money, just because it was a good promo doesn't mean it was the right promo for the situation. What I mean was, I felt like it was a little longer winded than it needed to be. To me, the basic gist of the promo should have been something to the effect of, Brock Lesnar came, Brock Lesnar saw, Brock Lesnar conquered, uh, three opponents, sold out Barclays, you reigning, defending, undisputed, universal champion, Brock Lesnar. And then that's it. We don't need the few minutes of diatribe and the few minutes of build up and hype up and everything else. Also, could Brock Lesnar please stop hopping around so much during Heyman's promo? It's a little bit of distraction and it looks a little bit ridiculous. I think he looks a little more menacing when he sits there and just kind of uh, mean gene skeletons the shit. You know, just stand there. And then maybe every once in a while you bounce once. Maybe you give a little smirk and a smile and that's it. But then Braun Strowman comes out. And this was part of the thing I'm talking about is that's where everybody knew this was going. So why beat around the bush? Why do a bunch of other bullshit? Get in, get what you need to say, get done with it, and then move on to the part that everybody wants to see. Now we know that they're going to Strowman and Lesnar at no mercy. And this will be really interesting to see what the company does. Do they have the courage to pull the trigger? Do they? We're going to find out. The segment, obviously, very good. The company has done a very good job with Strowman after some initial stumbles a while back. They've realized what they've got here, and they've got somebody that could be a major player for them for a long time to come. I really enjoyed the segment. I will note that Strowman's reaction wasn't quite as great as I would have expected, and that is in part, I think, because the opponent isn't Roman Reigns. So this program, as much as anything, is critical for Strowman, critical for the WWE, because we're going to find out very quickly. Is Strowman really, truly, organically, massively over? Or was he just truly, massively over because he was going against Roman Reigns? We're going to find out. Then we dive right into the Brooklyn street fight between Big Gas and Enzo because we needed another one of uh, these matches, right? And, and I'm sorry. The sabotaging of Enzo is stupid. I don't care if he annoys you or not. You don't take over characters and sabotage them because they annoy you. That's stupid. And I'll talk about that more in a separate video this week. But this whole split and feud continuing has been stupid. The split feud itself has been kind of stupid. And I really feel like nobody's gained much of anything other than maybe you could say big ass getting a little more mic time. Other than that, what has either guy really gained in this case? Did Cass get a whole lot from beating a big show? Did Cass get a whole lot from squashing Enzo a couple of times? Did Enzo get anything out of being involved with Big Show or getting squashed by Big Cass? I don't think so. And then, of course, it is only perfect karma for the WWE in doing all of this shit that during the match, Pop goes the Cass hole and he's apparently legitimately hurt his damn knee. Just the perfect cap on this whole cluster of a situation. Perfect cap on it. Good job, WWE. I know you can't control the injury, but you don't put these guys in these type of situations. Maybe that shit doesn't happen. And this is your karma coming to collect. The chicken's coming home to roost. 
Shouldn't have split him up to begin with. Wasn't time. Nia Jax, thank you for beating Emma's ass. Fucking Emma is annoying as shit. And the one thing I will say, if she's on TV every week, as long as they continue to squash her out to everybody, I'm okay with that because to me that is her certified role. is to provide me two to three minutes, a quick match amusement, while she's getting her shit pushed in and she continues to get buried like the hell she deserves. Hashtag give Emma CPR my ass because... Who would give her mouth to mouth? I'm sure some of you fucking would. I sure the hell wouldn't. Better watch it. That bitch gonna steal your wallet. Uh, who wants to walk with Elias? Well, especially now because the man has his own t-shirt. We've just got even more reasons to walk with him if we didn't already. Stop cutting his damn performances off though. This shit is gold. This ring rock Jesus gimmick is getting massively over. And he's the one guy... It's really fascinating to me, one of the few guys, I should say, that you try to push as a heel, and the crowd initially pops when they see him, and he gets ready to sing, and he starts to get a babyface reaction, and then going with the cheap heat local shit, he always brings him back heel. It's kind of like a little genius Lanny Poffo type of thing. Pretty, pretty cool to me. Elias versus R-Truth, nothing special. I wish they would have Elias wrestle less and sing more because that's the way I think his character is going to really monstrously get over. But the guy has massive potential and I, I, I'd be surprised if a lot of other people don't see it. The, the ability to make some money with this guy is there. It's there. The one hour main event segment. Kurt Angle's coming out and at first I opined on Twitter. I said, are we getting ready to have Raw get glorious? But then about 30 seconds later, I realized, oh no, they're just going to do this to introduce John Cena. And ultimately it was... And he's there to call somebody out. I was really hoping he was actually there after Roman came out. I was hoping he was going to say, I wasn't talking about you. I was talking about Samoa Joe. It would have been a nice little jab to kind of build some heat for later on down the road. And I'm really surprised that the WWE is so stubbornly sticking to their guns. Because that's clearly what it is at this point. They still are stubbornly sticking to their guns with Lesnar and Reigns at 34. I applaud having a plan. I understand having a plan and a vision, and that's great. But the best laid out, made out plans sometimes need to be scrapped. And the simple fact of the matter is, the Money Mania match is not Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns. The Money Mania match is John Cena versus Roman Reigns. And to initially go here like you were almost diving all the way into it, even though I don't think they're going to go there just yet, maybe they'll do it at Survivor Series, is just foolish. Just because you can do it right away doesn't mean you should do it right away. And there's a whole different way to go about this. Cena, Reigns, belt, no belt, doesn't matter, is a WrestleMania main event. You should not be giving it away on a secondary pay-per-view or even something like a Survivor Series. And I'm really glad The Miz... Got his chance to come out here. Because at first I thought, wow, you're doing the Reigns Cena thing. And then all of a sudden here comes Miz. How are you going to shoehorn him in? Uh, well, after the initial botch of the arena name, talking about Barclays Center, Miz was on fire and he should have been. And I'm glad he got the opportunity to show how pissed he was and how legitimately pissed he was and how legitimately pissed he should have been that he had to go out there and perform at SummerSlam in front of nobody. Shame again on the WWE, how fucking stupid it was. And I'm glad Miz put everything kind of on blast, talking about his moment. The Miz sometimes can be a little botchy on the mic at moments. But man, when he gets on a roll and he gets in a rhythm, he could be really, really, really damn good. Especially when he ramp up the intensity and he gets kind of into that work shoot type of mode. He can be really, really good. And then out comes Samoa Joe to say if anybody's going to tag with Miz against these two fucks, because apparently somehow Cena comes to Raw and immediately has matchmaking powers. Even Roman's like, what the hell? <laughs> Joe says he wants to tag with Miz later tonight. Great. But all this whole segment did, I will say, is for the moment, make me want to see Miz versus Cena for the IC title, Roman versus Joe, or Cena versus Joe. And frankly, at this particular moment, I would much rather see Cena versus Joe because I think there is literally over a decade and a half of story there going back to their UPW training days when Cena was the freaking prototype. That's the match right now. And again, just because you can do Reign Cena sooner doesn't mean you should. Uh, the eight-man cruiserweight tag match. 
The cruiserweights are now the new Divas division. You got a random multi-person tag match to cross-promote a show that gets far less viewership. Are we talking about the Divas and Total Divas or are we talking about the cruiserweights in 205 Live? And the thing is, is the cruiserweight tag is launching into and promoting a show that gets far less viewership on the network than Total Divas did on E. And look at it a year later. JD from New York and everybody else that wanted to be smart asses about it. Ha ha ha, I was right, you're fucking wrong. Eat shit, tell me how my ass tastes. The cruiserweight division on Raw was fucking stupid as an idea for the reasons I spelled out a year ago. And look at how fucking stupid it is now. Fuck you! Don't you ever sit there and doubt the Schleg Daddy again! I know what the fuck I'm talking about! Fucking goons. Anyways, moving on to things that were somewhat stupid. Ambrose and Rollins and their celebration of winning the tag titles. Cool. Whatever. Shit! Here comes the fucking Hardys! It's like, oh my god! This is kind of cool! Oh my god! This could be interesting! But fuck, why watch the pay-per-views? Why wait for the pay-per-views when you can just get it on Raw, when you can just give it away on TV? And I will say this, is even though there's a part of me that says, why would you fucking give away this match on TV? On the flip side of it, number one, far more people watch your television than watch the WWE Network. So if anything, you would think that the network would take a backseat to Raw and SmackDown each week. I'm just saying, even though the whole model is kind of mixed up, again, when you're only charging people $9.99 a month for the network, the priority on it decreases significantly. On top of that, it also teases kind of the element of you never know what's going to happen on Raw. You never know what you can see on Raw. So every once in a while, it is okay to give away one of these pay-per-view style matches for free on television. The match itself was very, very good. The finish, though, was stupid and not necessary. We do not need to have Ambrose and Rollins go over the Hardys here. There is no real end game for this. It's not like you're automatically just going to have them become broken all of a sudden. Nothing like that. This was just having the Hardys put somebody over for the fuck all of it. This is where you should have had some type of double count out. You know, the old 20 minute time limit draw would have been perfect right here. Because I think both teams would have gotten something out of that. Ambrose and Rollins went 20 minutes with one of the greatest tag teams in WWE history. The Hardys went 20 minutes with the WWE Tag Team Raw Champions. Both sides get something from it. And you've got a reason, more importantly, to do a return match other than to say, oh, the match is going to be really good. That's a dumb fucking reason to have a return match from a story standpoint. The story standpoint is we couldn't beat them. We couldn't beat them. We need to figure out who the better team is. That's how you do business. That's how you make money. Not sitting there and just having Ambrose and Rollins go over for the fuck all of it after a long ass Raw match. I'm just saying. I I do want to point out one thing. I do want to point out one thing. When Sasha Banks said in her promo that every time she's faced Alexa Bliss, she's either ran away or tapped out. Uh, Sasha, did we forget about the broken and bloody noses? I'm just saying. I, I still can't wrap my fingers around how Sasha Banks was a late replacement for Bailey in her alleged injury. And you had Alexa Bliss featured during SummerSlam with that Harley Quinn creepy cheerleader crap as kind of like a featured athlete for no mercy. So you put the strap on Sasha Banks. So then what? She can lose the strap neck? Just all types of weird and dumb. And the fact that we're going to do this match next week, does that mean we're going to do yet another one on pay-per-view at No Mercy? Does that mean that we're going to have yet another title change? Is this yet another belt we are going to hot potato? I don't know. At least I will give the WWE credit. The whole thing with Jason Jordan, he actually appeared on screen with his dad. Imagine that. I still think there's more mileage in doing vignettes where they're catching up on all the things that he didn't do over the years, such as play catch, go fishing, golf, Chase girls, have that talk about the birds and the bees, all of that stuff. Could you imagine Kurt Angle in a vignette trying to give Jason Jordan the talk about the birds and the bees? Could you imagine with Kurt Angle's comedic timing and delivery? Oh my God. But nonetheless, Jason Jordan wants competition, so he randomly pulls Finn Balor's name out of a fucking hat. And my God, was that completely random. And I cannot lie, the show is going pretty well. But I'm, and I'm not kidding. As soon as, and you will notice that Twitter kind of went dark for OTRS Central 
once this match really took off. As soon as Finn Balor's entrance happened, I dozed off for a few minutes. That's no lie. That's the real dope. And what else would I expect? Because Finny the Twink fucking sucks, okay? He's got the entrance and he's got the demon paint. And it's not SummerSlam, so now he's only got one of them. And after that, you might as well not even fucking bother. He's just another ham and egger. And I'm sorry, that's the fucking truth. And eventually, those of you that don't understand that and don't get that now, you are going to at some point in time. Believe me, you will. But the match, as I went back and watched it a little bit later, it was okay. Just okay. But WWE, stop putting Jason Jordan in these positions where he's clearly going to get booed. But if you are, then embrace the hate, embrace the heel turn, and run with it. And I do want to point out, I do want to point out, Finn Balor is so fucking popular. I don't give a damn if he's facing Roman Reigns or Jason Jordan or a freaking broomstick. The fans didn't give a shit about his match. That tells you in that smarky-ass Brooklyn Barclay Center crowd, they didn't give a shit about something Finn Balor was doing. Don't tell me he doesn't fucking suck. Period. And speaking of suck, the main event. Miz and Joe versus Cena and Reigns. All a waste of fucking time to ultimately have the baby faces go over. You have the Miz talking about this and talking about his moment and doing all this crap. Why can't you just have Miz hit the skull crushing finale on Cena? I'm just saying. Or have him hit the skull crushing finale and then there's a DQ, there's a counter. There are so many other finishes other than the we send the, send the fans home pissed because we send the fans home happy because we actually want to pretend that the majority of these people in this arena on this night actually like Roman Reigns and John Cena. Even though several times throughout the course of the night the fans are chanting, you both suck. You both suck. <laughs> but, but whatever, whatever. I don't know where they're going to go from here. To me, it still seems like they are pushing towards Cena and Joe. And to me, that is the right call. That is the right match at this time. They need to as far away from Reigns and Cena as they can until WrestleMania. I know they're not going to because they're stupid. Because Vince and Triple H are going to stubbornly dig in their heels and say, God damn it! This is like warrior shit. We're going to pound it down your throat until you like it. And you're going to get Reigns and Lesnar at 34, whether you want it or not. Well, I think at this point in time, the simple truth is, with all the other options and alternatives you have, the last thing a lot of people want is Reigns versus Lesnar at 34. Well, with that said, like I said, I, I thought this was a better show this week. You had several highlights. Not as many things that really aggravated me or irked me. This was good. And it was raw after SummerSlam and you can naturally reset and do some things here that you probably won't do next week. But I actually enjoyed Raw quite a bit more than SummerSlam. And it's the one that was six hours, including pre-show, that I pay $9.99 a month to subscribe to. That was much worse than the one that is part of my cable package uh, that I watch every single week. It's just really, really bad. But anyways, you can let me know in the comment section your thoughts on this week's Raw. I am the Schlag Daddy and this is, of course, OTRS Central. Not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. And remember, as with SummerSlam especially, I watch this shit so you don't have to. You're welcome.